Hello and welcome to a masterclass in Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Robert Festigi. And in this program, we're going to go through part three of Our Lady in the New Testament. Uh, part one talked about the infancy narratives, especially as contained in Luke. Part two went into uh, the infancy narratives as well uh, in Matthew and the beginning of the references of John, the prologue, and of course, the wedding of Cana. And now in part three, we've got some really remarkable passages to discuss. Um, Our Lady at the Foot of the Cross, um, Galatians 4.14, the woman who's part of the plan of salvation, uh, Pentecost, Acts 1.14, uh, and then to Revelations 11.19, the Ark of the Covenant, and then Revelations 12.1, the profound prophecy of the woman clothed with the sun. So, Thanks for being with us, Robert, in this uh, biblical uh, journey and uh, completing Our Lady in the New Testament. Always great to have you. Oh, it's wonderful to be with you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So let's begin with John 19. And again, this is such a massively pregnant passage, but let's, bring, let's begin with the text, if we can, please. Yes, very good. In the, well, I almost feel like praying before reading. <laughs> That's a good sign, Robert. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Uh -huh. And it begins here, uh, uh, Mark, I mean, John 19. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Uh, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple her took her to his own home. Yeah. Uh, well, let's start. So here. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. No, there's just so much here. I'll let you yeah, start. Yeah, 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 it's extraordinary. And let's start with the first wo uh, word that uh, our Lord uses to refer to Mary. Woman. Clearly. Anybody who had a pre-thought that woman was obnoxious or, or disrespectful uh, could never claim that Jesus, as he's about to die, would call his mother something derogatory. It is, in fact, quite the opposite. It is Jesus identifying Mary as the woman of Genesis yes. and the woman of Cana, and now she's the woman of Calvary. She's the woman with the God man of salvation. Uh, it's, it's really an indication of her co-redemptive role with Jesus throughout the whole revelation of scripture. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, when she's standing there under the cross, the contemplation of the church and of saints and mystics began to understand through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what was going on with our blessed mother there under the cross because she's the mother and so there developed that uh, great tradition of her offering her son uniting herself to his sacrificial offering and pope pius uh, the ninth blessed pius the ninth he gave an address on september 20th 1874 and basically what he said is when she was there under the cross, she was standing, but the sword was piercing the side of the crucified Lord, and she remained a motionless onlooker, not as weaklings who were assisting at the developed desolating tragedy as if it were an exhibition, but as a woman meditating, suffering, and hoping. At this sight, the words of the aged Simeon came back to her, that that, that dear child would be a sword of great sorrow, which would pierce her mother's heart. So under the cross, she recalls that Simeon predicts that there will be this sword piercing her heart. And as you well know, great saints and mystics like St. Bridget of, of Sweden understood that this was Mary's co-redemptive moment. That uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, certainly, Robert. And, uh, you know, my mind goes back to St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who's the first to talk about Mary offering Jesus to the Father. And the context of his comments 
are precisely the presentation, but that just redoubles the awareness that everything that happens at the presentation is fulfilled at Calvary. A mother offers her son in sacrifice to the father. That's the prophecy of Simeon. That's what happens at Calvary. John Paul II also speaks, I always say saint, but I, I suppose if we're in their in their lifespan, we can, we can be more familiar anyway. Saint John Paul II talks about Mary's offering of Jesus to the Father. That's why he compares Mary to Abraham in offering Isaac. And so this is all fulfilled, and, and he uses the words, which always ring to me, that Mary was spiritually crucified with her crucified son, and mm -hmm. that her co-redemptive role did not cease with the glorification of her son. That's what's happening at Calvary. Active cooperation in the redemption of humanity. That's why she's gotten the title since the 14th century of the co-redemptrix. Doesn't mean equal, of course not, but it means unique participation and active participation, as we've talked about many times. Yes, and I think of the great um, message revelation received, private revelation to St. Bridget in the 14th century, where she hears Jesus say, therefore, I can well affirm that my mother and I save man, as it were, with a single heart. I, by suffering in my heart and flesh, and she with the suffering and love of her heart. You know, and, and we remember that... Uh, at Vatican II, this was affirmed. People think, oh, this is just, um, you know, certain saints and mystics uh, thinking about this. But this is what is said at the Ecumenical Council, Vatican II, that, you know, she progressed in union with her son and his whole mission. And then it says, after this manner, the Blessed Virgin advanced in her pilgrimage of faith and faithfully persevered in her union with her son onto the cross where she stood in keeping with the divine plan grieving exceedingly with her only begotten son uniting herself with a maternal heart with his sacrifice and lovingly consenting to the immolation of this victim which she herself had brought forth now, it's an extraordinary reference uh, you know lumen gentium 58 now, and again, good people have commented in terms of, you know, the beauty of the council's treatment on Our Lady. But as the council itself says in, in, in Lumen Gentium 54, it does not intend to give a complete doctrine on Mary. And as we've talked about before, there were authors like Carl, uh, like uh, Carl Rahner, who thought any reference of Mary's mediatrix would be against ecumenism and, and the, the text would be disastrous. They took out the term co-redemptrix for that reason, etc., but here you have a profoundly sublime reference, which is all footnoted by the popes of the early 20th century, with saying that Mary suffered in her heart what Jesus is suffering, to the extent a human can, that she consented to the immolation of the victim which was born of her. That's an extraordinary statement. She's consenting. She's not just enduring. She's saying, yes, I wish this to happen because of the perfect will of the Father and my perfect obedience to his will. Now, that's if that's not co-redemptive, I don't know what could be. Yes, exactly, exactly. And as, as Benedict XV uh, had expressed in 1918 in uh, Inter Sodalicia, you know, she surrendered her mother's rights and offered her son. So she had a type of uh, authority over him but she surrenders and offers him to the father. And, and then he says, so we could well say that she together with our Lord redeemed the human race. But of course, that's explained by St. Pius X that her merit is congruous, fitting, appropriate, but our Lord's uh, merit is absolute. It's condign, co-dignity. But you know, St. John Paul II probably meditated on this passage of John, uh, as our dear friend Monsignor Arthur Calkins often pointed out, probably more than any other pope. And he has that magnificent meditation on this in that apostolic letter, Selvifici Dolores of uh, February 11th, 1984. And he says there that Mary's suffering under the cross reached a, a, a height that we could part hardly even imagine you know it, it, you know uh, you know it goes up 
ad fastigium, up to the height that you could. But then he he, he mentions this, that um, it, it was on Calvary that Mary's suffering beside the suffering of Jesus reached an intense intensity which can hardly be imagined from a human point of view, but which was mysterious and supernaturally fruitful for the redemption of the world. Now, I'm that, so glad so, you read that, Robert. I'm so glad you read that because redemption of the world, not her redemption alone, not just, a, none of us can say that, Robert. None of us can say our sufferings are meritorious for the redemption of the world. Uh, in another translation, John Paul talks about how her suffering is a contribution for the redemption of the world. That, that means objective redemption. We've talked about this before. Only the new Adam and the new Eve participate in universal redemption. There's not a new John. There's not a new Mar not a new Magdalene. There's not a new Mark. And dare I say, there's not a new Robert at Calvary. Only Jesus and Mary. And that's why her suffering is different than all the rest of our suffering. You know, uh, again, in Salve Feature Loris, which I think is just, uh, just a step under scripture. I think it's so profoundly beautiful. But John Paul will also comment on Colossians 1.24 on making up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ and how we're all called to do it. Uh, but only Mary participates and contributes to the redemption of us all. That's objective redemption. The rest of us are in subjective redemption. That is to say, the mysterious release of grace. So, but I, I want to get back. You, I'm so glad you mentioned St. John Paul II, of course. But, you know, he, he he's confirming Leo XIII with the basic um, roles at Calvary. So you have Jesus, obviously, you have Our Lady, and then you have John. And John represents two great groups. One is all Christians, all who seek to be beloved disciples. And secondly, all humanity. Oh, yeah. Well, please. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but but uh, uh, this is this is brought out so beautifully in Leo the 13th, 1895 encyclical Adutricem. And he meditates on John, the beloved disciple. And he he writes the mis the mystery of Christ's immense love for us is revealed with dazzling brilliance in the fact that the dying savior bequeathed his mother to his disciple John in the memorable testament, testament, behold thy son. Now in John, as the church has constantly taught, Christ designated the whole human race, and in the first rank are those who are joined with him by faith. Yeah, beautiful. I'm so glad you read that. And that's, that's the whole foundation of the fact that Mary's motherhood is universal. Why is it universal? Because everything that's happening at Calvary in relation to Jesus and Mary is universal. And then John takes on a universality because he's the recipient of sure. this great gift of our Lord's motherhood. And John Paul, again, says a Redemptorist Mater that the gift of Mary's motherhood is a, is a gift that Christ makes personally to each individual. That means... If we don't accept Mary as mother, we are sadly rejecting a direct personal gift from the crucified Christ. Uh, and that's why it is a universal gift. And that's why she's a spiritual mother of all peoples. That's right. And also in Redemptoris Mater, St. John Paul II notes that when it, 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 it reads, from that moment on, the disciple took Mary into his home. The Greek really is deeper. It's aista idia. Right. So idia means that which is his own into his very being. So our Lord was giving his mother as, to be our mother, and we are to receive her into our hearts, into our very being, because he knew we needed a mother, a spiritual mother, and he gives us his body and blood, but he also gives us his mother. What a great gift. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And again, yeah, that that is the idea. I mean, and this is not a, you know, ill-willed in, in, in interpretation or translation, but it would have been best had we not inserted the word home, quite frankly, into his own, into his possession. John Paul will say in that same document, into his interior life, into our spiritual life. That's where we're called to bring Our Lady. 
is yeah. into our hearts, our, our spiritual endeavors, our, our spiritual dimensions. And so home is nice, but home is a geography. This is far more profound. It's to bring Mary, Mary spiritual. And that's why John Paul almost uses, well, it doesn't almost, he does use John 19, 25, 27 as an example of, of, uh, of spiritual foundation for marrying consecration. Because he will go on to say, all Christians should imitate John. And that is to bring Mary into our own, into our spiritual life. Well, that's really, he uses the word entrustment, but in the Polish, entrustment and consecration are almost synonymous. And so it's really a biblical example by John for all Christians to bring Mary into our souls, into our spiritual lives. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, both entrustment and consecration are rich words, but popes have used consecration. And it, it, it means making an, a, a dedication that is sacred. That's where the word sacrum is in there. And Pope Francis has not been shy about using the word consecrate. So we know some Mariologists say, no, no, we need a fidamento, not a consecrazione. But, but, uh, no, but non è giusto, non è giusto. It's not right. <laughs> yeah, yes. They're not right. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, John, I mean, when Pope Francis consecrated the world, including Russia and Ukraine, on March 25th, he used consecration. He doesn't. He doesn't back off that because that's that's what the act is. Well, you know, there's so much on John 19, Robert. We could do a whole program on that, but we've got a few more passages to go. Any last thoughts on John 19 that you want to add before we move on to um, to Galatians? I would just say this is central because we see Mary as the fulfillment here of the woman of Genesis 3:15. You know, the woman who actively. Uh, uh, unites with Christ in his saving mission at Cana. She's the woman there. And now she's the woman. Woman, behold thy son. Our Lord is making us, uh, make, uh, revealing to us that Mary has this central role for in our lives, our spiritual lives. But then also the recognition by saints, mystics, and popes that she actively, she wasn't there just as a passive onlooker, but she united herself uh, to his sacrifice and she also offered herself and her sufferings. So she provides a model for all of us. That's why St. John Paul II several times spoke to the sick and said, "Unite if you unite your sufferings to those of the cross, can you not be co-redeemers of humanity? But Mary, as you so beautifully pointed out, participates in the objective act under the cross. Uh, and but we can make our own uh, uh, repar uh, acts of reparation in union with with Our Lady and uh, also reparation to our Immaculate Heart. But that would be a whole other program. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you bring up co-redeemers in Christ. Uh, you're at the bottom line, especially for uh, those who are uh, using this as a, a you know graduate or doctoral seminar kind of thing. We can't get away from participation. It would be the kiss of death to us theologically. When we can't see analogously what Jesus does as the divine redeemer first, what Our Lady does as the immaculate human being secondly and participating in his act of redemption um, and participating actively in that. And then thirdly for the church, even though we don't contribute to the infinite meriting of graces, we release those graces. Pius XII talks about that in Mystery Corporis, a mysterious release of grace when we do Colossians 1.24, when we make up what is lacking uh, in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Uh, but when people uh, balk at the title co-redemptrix, just as a title, you know, we have to say once again, it's a one word title, which is summarizing and synthesizing the entire doctrine of Mary's unique role with and under Jesus in the work of redemption. Is that so really controversial? Would anybody, do you think, again, Paul or Peter or or Padre Pio or St. Francis or Mother Teresa or St. John Paul II would say, no, I think I did more in participating in the redemption than Jesus. It, it, it's, it's almost laughable. And, and so why is there such a opposition to the title? I think because people have lost the understanding of participation and analogy, that two things can be related in an essential way, but also have an essential difference. Mary is co-redemptrix. Uh, essentially because she's truly participating in the historic acquisition of graces. 
Mary's not uh, a redemptrix in the sense that she's doing it on the level of Jesus Christ, as you properly distinguish between condign and, and congruent merit. We participate in the act of Jesus with Our Lady, but we don't do it in an objective fashion. But these are all legitimate analogies. And that's why the title of co-redemptrix simply should not be feared. It's completely accurate. Even the guys that pulled it out of the uh, at the council uh, in the subcommittee granted that a title absolutely true in itself, they said, uh, but taking out for ecumenical reasons. Exactly, exactly. And, and we have to remember Mary, it, it plays such an essential role in, in the incarnation. I mean, there's, that's why she, where would Jesus be without Mary? He, he didn't want to, you know, to just become man without a mother. Okay. So she had to say yes. So we go back to the Annunciation and, and she said yes on behalf of all human nature, as St. Thomas Aquinas says. That's, this is all when we see the role of Mary in um, going from, the, from her Immaculate Conception to her Annunciation to the wedding feast at Cana, Mary under the cross. We see how it all fits together. And this is why Pope Francis said so, so beautifully in 2020, January 1st, there's no salvation without the woman. Yeah, exactly. And let's now go to a final time uh, or a fifth time in our counting uh, of where scripture refers to Mary as woman. So let's go to Galatians 4.4. 4, uh, and let's speak a little bit about St. Paul's uh, principal reference, uh, in some would say exclusive reference, uh, to the fact that God willed to have his son enter human history through a woman. Yeah. Why would Paul make reference to that? I mean, it's actually a critically important, it's, it's so critical, it's where the Second Vatican Council's treatment on Our Lady starts. It starts with Galatians 4.4. Exactly, exactly. It's such a powerful scripture, but I'll read it for you. Um, but when the time had come fully, God sent forth his son born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. But, you know, another translation is when the blessed fullness of time had come, right. God right. sent his son born of a woman and so that and that that really being born of a woman means that he is consubstantial with you with human nature with us and it mary is the link she's the bridge of god to the human nature and so that that's why she's the bridge as pope francis says between us and god and there's such depth to this uh, St. John Paul II actually begins his great encyclical, uh, Redemptoris Mater, the Mother of the Redeemer, uh, meditating on Galatians 4.4. He says, the fullness indicates the moment fixed from all eternity when the Father sent his Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It denotes the blessed moment when the Word that was with God became flesh and dwelt among us and made himself our brother. It marks the moment when the Holy Spirit, who had already infused the fullness of grace into Mary of Nazareth, formed in her virginal womb the human nature of Christ. This fullness marks the moment when, with the entrance of, e of the eternal into time, time itself is redeemed. <laughs> That's remarkable. I mean, the... Uh, Going on about the, the brilliance of John Paul II, yeah, that we should do a series just on him. But anyway, the, the, his Mariology is, is so massively rich and full. But in those two verses between Galatians 4.4 4 to 4.6, we really, Robert, we have the whole cycle of redemption because it starts with God the Father. And, uh, you know, some say that the Holy Spirit is a forgotten member of the Trinity. I tend to think that the, God the Father is the forgotten member of the Trinity. Uh, because there's so little said of him, um, and it's such a sad thing as we're in an age of father deprivation. At any rate, starts with God the Father. He sends the Son, number two, our Lord Jesus, through a woman. And this passage, uh, Robert, would, would protect so against so many heresies of thinking that the Gnostic heresy, uh, later Nestorian heresy, 
all these heresies that denied the true humanity of Jesus Christ. And so you go from God the Father to Jesus to the woman to us as adopted sons to the Holy Spirit. And Paul asks the question, you know, so what do the adopted sons say? Well, you would think they'd say, you know, uh, Jesus, right? He's our Savior. No, the Spirit has them say, Abba, Father. So that you have the whole cycle of redemption in two verses of Scripture. God the Father, Jesus, our mother, we as adopted sons and daughters, the Holy Spirit, who returns us back to the Father. But the mother is critically in there, and that's not accidental, that God wanted a woman involved in the greatest act of, of all time in history, and that's human redemption. And there she is, clearly identified in that passage. That's right. That's why the great solemnity of the Annunciation, as St. Paul VI said, is a joint solemnity. It's celebrating Mary and Jesus, because it's the moment uh, when she conceives the word of God in her womb. And then nine months later on Christmas, uh, uh, we celebrate the birth of our Lord. But he could not be uh, conceived and born without the woman. So, yeah, and this had, sorry, Robert. No, 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 no. That's why St. John Paul II said, at, you know, at the, at the, at the, in salvation history, at the very center, there is a woman. And the fact that it starts this way shouldn't surprise us that it ends this way in the sense that God wants a woman involved in salvation. He has Mary involved with and under Jesus' redemption. But you have to go, you know, and I, going back to John Paul II's statement in, in Guayaquil in uh, January 31st of 1985, he says, her co-redemptive role did not cease with the glorification of her son. Well, glory in the Gospel of John always makes reference to Calvary. So this is uh, why her role as co-redemptrix doesn't stop at Calvary. It continues precisely as the mediatrix of all graces and as advocate, because once the grace is acquired, the grace then has to be distributed, dispensed. It has to get from the infinite storehouses to the human heart. And that's how Our Lady continues the co-redemptive role, which was started by giving saying yes and, and, and giving flesh to the word, but it doesn't stop there. Um, St. Paul VI in a beautiful line where he says, it's a matter of faith that we uh, believe in Mary's spiritual maternity, also says you can't expect a mother to give birth to a human being and to have it stop there without the continuation in the formation of the human being. So too for Our Lady. It doesn't, she's not a surrogate mother. She's not just a physical channel. She continues after the incarnation and, and up to the present, of course. Yes, and, and, and it's, he's, as you mentioned, John Paul II so beautifully expresses this January 31st, 1985 in Guayaquil, in Ecuador. He says, in fact, at Calvary, she, Mary, united herself with the sacrifice of her son that led to the foundation of the church. Her maternal heart shared in the very depths uh, in the to the very depths, the will of Christ to gather into one all the dispersed children of God, having suffered for the church, Mary deserved to become the mother of all the disciples of her son, the mother of their unity. You know, and, and the Gospels do not tell us of an appearance of the risen Christ to Mary. Nevertheless, as she was in a special way close to the cross of her son, she also had to have a privileged experience of his resurrection. In fact, Mary's role as co-redemptrix did not cease with the glorification of her son. So this is so important. You know, she's, she, she's not like, I did my work. You know, right. I can go to heaven now. She's the mother continuously. That's why she's given to us as our mother uh, by our Lord under the cross. And so uh, she continues. That, that is exactly right. I, I have to say, with all due respect to some of our um, uh, uh, colleagues of the past saying, well, you know, uh, John Paul mentions co-redemptive, but they're, they're, they're marginal texts or they're just dropping the name without any theology. My gosh, here in, in one address in Gaekil, 
he, he he's doing a commentary on scripture and on Lumen Gentium 58. Yes. And then continuation. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a catechesis in a heart there. It's a beautiful references. And I would dare say, without trying to be presumptuous, that I would so prefer, quote, marginal texts of St. John Paul II than uh, opinions of theologians. However uh, significant they believe them to be, I think these texts are not marginal, especially in light of Lumen Gentium 25, when it's the ongoing teachings of the Roman pontiff. The consistency is a factor of whether or not it's part of the ordinary magisterium. And John Paul, along with Pius XI before him, who three times he uses the title, uh, shows this and manifests this. Exactly. And going back even to 1885, Leo XIII approving lauds to Jesus and Mary that include the title co-redemptrix of, of, of the world. But, you know, so someone uh, pointed out that a guy, Akil, or Pope John Paul II actually says the co-redemptive role of Mary, el papel corredentur. But, you know, suppose I spoke about your paternal role. You're a father. Isn't that the same thing as your role as father? Right, so, right, right. And that's simply how the English translators uh, translated it. Uh, but we have the other six references. And I believe one of our Italian friends uh, found yet another uh, co redemptive uh, reference of uh, Our Lady co redemptrix Well, once again, uh, time is the enemy, Robert. We have to go on. These passages are so endlessly rich. Uh, but let's go to Acts one fourteen. As we're talking about Mary's role as co-redemptrix did not cease after the glorification of her son. We're talking about her role as mediatrix of all graces. Well, we're going to see this in the early church. And Mary as mother, and as St. John Paul II says, mother and teacher of the early church. Well, this is going to continue at the definitive birth of the church, if we could call it that, at Pentecost. So if you could please make reference to that. Well, Great here's Acts 1.14. One, one all these, all the, the apostles, uh, with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. So this is uh, Mary in the upper room at the cenacle, and she's there in the center as mother. So she's not just one among the many, but she's the mother of Jesus. So she has a privileged place, you, we could say. Uh, maybe you could elaborate more on that. Yeah, uh, we, we certainly can say that uh, because she's also mother of the early church. You know, again, as St. John Paul will say, he even insinuates that in a special way, the prayers of Mary brought down the Holy Spirit. Why? Yeah. Because spousals ha spouses have that special love. But that also means, you know, I often uh, admire, you know, watching uh, you know a married couple when the wife is trying to call the husbands across the noisy room. And so there was you think, well, there's no way he's going to hear that. All of a sudden he turns his head. Why? Because spouses are disposed to hearing the voice of the spouse. And so in that same way, the spirit hears the voice of Mary in a particular way, uh, because it's from her, his immaculate spouse. And, and that, again, St. Maximin Kolbe will, will do wonders with this. I mean, really, his, his sil syllogism is that, you know, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier, the author of all graces. The Holy Spirit chooses to act only through Mary, his human spouse. Therefore, Mary is the mediatrix of all the graces of the Spirit. And, and that's what's going to come forward through this powerful event of the definitive birth of Pentecost for the church. Exactly. It's such a rich tradition of Mary, a spouse of the Holy Spirit. It's there in St. Francis of Assisi, and it's certainly there in St. Louis de Montfort and uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe, and dare we say St. John Paul II. You know, the, the, she's the mystical spouse. He adds mystical in one prayer, just because sometimes people see things so literally these days, but she is the true spouse of the Holy Spirit, and as St. Maximilian Kolbe said, she incarnates all of the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit. So she's almost like a quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit, or she at least manifests what the Holy Spirit can completely do to sanctify a human being. Well, and as St. Maximilian says so profoundly, that the Holy Spirit doesn't have to act only through Mary, but he chooses. This is not necessity, but it's divine disposition. Well, 
it worked pretty well the first time because Jesus came through the over the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit of Our Lady. How appropriate it is that all of created grace would follow the root of uncreated grace, and that the created grace would come to us from the Spirit through Our Lady. So if we really understand what St. Maximilian is saying, is that we don't get the gifts of the Spirit except through Mary. And that, by the way, includes our Protestant brothers and sisters. It's not uh, based on uh, always uh, faith, but it's causality. In other words, even if they don't know, even if they don't have faith in Our Lady, they're still getting each and every gift of the Spirit through the Blessed Mother. And I think in a special way, she has a particular heart to her children who have somehow lost her, uh, as Pope Francis is so frequent in saying, you know, the Christian without Mary is an orphan. And that's a very strong statement. That's right. And we give thanks to Pope Francis for establishing as an obligatory memorial, the Monday after Pentecost, the, uh, the memorial of Mary, mother of the church. And, you know, I, I heard that some people who don't like Vatican II, they, they say, oh, this was just an innovation of of, of Paul the Sixth at Vatican II. No, um, <laughs> Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, they refer to Mary as Mother of the Church. Or you could go back to sayings of Saint Augustine and uh, uh, the Saint, uh, well, Saint Leo the Great. You know, which in equivalent terms recognize Mary as the Mother of all the faithful. Well, right, and 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 again, based on Augustine. She's physical mother of the head. She's spiritual mother of all the members united to the head. I mean, that's that's late fourth, early fifth century Mariology. Well, if the mystical body is the church, where's the difficulty? It's a it's a very clear reference. If she's mother of the mystical body, uh, she's certainly mother of the church. That's and so, right. uh, yeah, I uh, I think again the pneumatol pneumatol uh, pneumatological dimension. Uh, which uh, e even, uh, you know, Cardinal Ratzinger at one point mentioned uh, that, you know, we really need to develop more pneumatology regarding Our Lady. And I couldn't help but wonder, have you read St. Maximilian Kolbe? Yeah, because, and really, the Shaban, of which he certainly has read, uh, but de Montfort and Kolbe bring forward so powerfully that the Spirit works through the Mother. And uh, even St. Maximilian says, that's why, you know, in a certain sense, Mary has the last name of the Spirit and the Spirit, you know, they have the same name in, in, in a reference of immaculate because that's what spouses do. So if you want to add confusion, we could say, yeah, Mary has three spouses. She has Joseph, she has Jesus, and she has the Holy Spirit. And sure. it's all true because of the, of the principle of analogy, all true, but in different ways. She's faithful to all three, one humanly to Joseph. One, in terms of being the, the ultimate disciple, uh, church to Christ, the bridegroom, and of the Holy Spirit, who chooses to bring supernatural life uh, through Our Lady in grace. That's right. And this is one reason why uh, Mary is ever virgin, because Joseph was aware that she had a special espousal union with God, you know, and, and some like St. John... Uh, St. John Damascene or Cardinal Beirut say she well, she's also spouse of the Father. Uh, St. Ephraim says she's the spouse of Christ. Uh, but uh, we St. Louis de Montfort and all these other great saints say she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Well, she's the spouse of God, you know, and, and, and but I like spouse of the Holy Spirit the best. I do too. I do too. I think, you know, it's like Shaban's uh, bridal maternity theologically, I think is very beautiful, but it, I think it's very hard for people to get the idea of thinking of our Blessed Mother as Mother of Jesus and also Spouse of Jesus at the same time. So, right. Spouse of the Spirit. And, that, and isn't it beautiful that Scripture calls the Holy Spirit the Advocate? He's the Divine Advocate. Mary is the Human Advocate, as St. Irenaeus, Doctor of the Church, says. It's, it's her first title. Why? Because the Spirit, the Divine Advocate, works through the Human Advocate for us. They're advocating for us, for our sanctity, sanctity and for our protection, ultimately for eternal life. Exactly. Well, Robert, we've got, again, these passages are so remarkable. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Uh, let's do two final passages. Let's do 11, uh, Revelations 11, 19. 
uh, just a quick reference to the Ark of the Covenant, because it's such a clear lead in, if you will, to the woman clothed with the sun. And then we'll uh, take on Revelations 12, 1 with a little bit more uh, time and detail. Good. Well, thank you. And here's Revelation eleven nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail, and a great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth, in anguish for delivery, and another portent appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems upon his head. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, that he might devour her child when she brought it forth. She brought forth a male child, one who is destined to rule all the nations with a rod of iron but her child was caught up to god and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place where she has in which she she has a place prepared by god in which to be nourished for 1260 days uh, another <laughs> Breathtaking passage. Let's start just briefly with the lead-in with the Ark of the Covenant. We've talked about this when we talked about Our Lady in Part One, uh, that Mary is the the ultimate Ark of the Covenant because in her, once she says yes to the invitation of the angel through the power of the Holy Spirit, is Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the law, which was contained in the Ark, the, the tablets. He's the fulfillment of priesthood, which is represented by the the, the rod, the staff of Aaron. Uh, and also, he is the fulfillment of the manna, uh, right. which represents nourishment and the Eucharist. So it's interesting. I, I was at a, at a medical appointment recently, and the doctor is very Catholic, but the nurse uh, was Protestant Christian. And we were talking about, actually, during a stress test, <laughs> just to add a little bit more stress, we were talking about the Ark of the Covenant as, as he was you know, winding up the, uh, the, the treadmill to get my heart going faster. And we're talking about... Uh, the beauty of the Ark of the Covenant, and she kind of jumped in and said, well, now I see the Ark of the Covenant as Jesus. Well, you see, well intended, but you see, if you say it's Jesus, you're missing the whole point. Jesus is inside the Ark. It's, it's like equating the outside of the Ark with what's inside of the Ark in the Old Testament. No, no. What's inside is more valuable. So in an effort to do something for Jesus, you're, you're really not doing the latria that Jesus alone deserves in adoration. Uh, no, what's in the ark is God uh, made man. What's outside the ark is the most perfect, immaculate, incorruptible human being, which we call Our Lady. Exactly. And that's what we see in, in Revelations eleven nineteen. 19, finally, after not knowing where the ark is for, for five centuries. Yes, and, and in his apostolic constitution, defining the assumption of Mary, you know, venerable Pius the Twelfth refers to scriptures which support the assumption, and one of which, of course, is the Ark of the Covenant. But then also the woman clothed with the sun. He he's, he 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 says. Moreover, the scholastic doctors have recognized the assumption of the Virgin Mary of God as something signified not only in various figures of the Old Testament, but also in that woman clothed with the sun whom John the Apostle contemplated on the island of Patmos. Right. And, and, and so I, when I teach uh, Mary in Scripture and, and uh, uh, um, Revelation 12, I just assemble a whole uh, a gathering of papal references uh, to, to the woman of Revelation 12 as Mary. And, of course, some say, well, uh, the woman of Revelation 12, uh, she represents Israel giving birth to the Messiah. Uh, uh, she represents uh, the church giving birth to new members. But it has to have a Marian dimension. She also represents Israel. She also represents the church. She's the type of the church. So all three images come together, but we can't exclude 
the Marian dimension, which popes all the way up through Pope Francis have clearly uh, uh, recognized. And Pope Francis links you know, the woman of Revelation 12 to Our Lady of Guadalupe, right. 1531. Right. And, and, uh, and, and dare I say, not only are all three present, but there must be a Marian primacy in understanding the text. It has to first be Mary for the simple reason that if you ask all humanity who gave birth to Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, only one woman can raise her hand. And so the others are powerful typologies and beautiful, but only one woman gave flesh to the word. And that has to be seen as primary, especially as you then enter what then takes place. And what then takes place is the great battle between the woman and the serpent. Well, guess what? Uh, we cannot, you know, uh, both in Genesis 3.15 with, with the serpent and, and, and Revelation 12 with the dragon, we are not immaculate, Robert. We cannot lead the battle, nor can Israel, nor can the church, like the mother can't, because she's the immaculate spouse of the spirit. She's the mother of the son. And she's the one, the bookends of scripture say, is going to lead the battle, which continues very dynamically right now. That's why, as we talked about before, if I consecrate myself to you and you consecrate yourself to me, it's a nice effort, but it's not going to bring up the triumph of the immaculate heart. Uh, and it's not going to bring us you know, great graces. But the church to consecrate itself to the church is not the same as the church consecrating itself to the mother the single mother, not to Israel, not just the church, but to the Immaculate Mother who leads us in the battle against Satan today. Exactly, exactly. I wonder if we could discuss also a, a, a problematic aspect of Revelation 12 that I don't think it's problematic, but some uh, scholars say, well, the woman's wailing in pain. Yeah. You Catholics say she gave birth without pain. You know, what? what is going on here? If I, I, if I may uh, read from uh, our friend, uh, uh, the great scripture scholar, Padre Stefano Manelli, and this is, uh, this is what he says, the pains of childbirth of the woman seem to constitute a particular problem if they are referred to the virginal childbirth of Mary at Bethlehem. If instead they are referred to the childbirth of Mary on Calvary, where she is constituted truly the mother of the members of Jesus Christ, as St. Augustine affirms, then we too can understand with other exegetes, among, of, uh, among them, Di Squalacci, that to Our Lady is to be ascribed a double childbirth, one natural and virginal, by which without pain or injury of any kind she begot the Son of God, the physical Christ, the other spiritual by means of which on Calvary, uniting her sufferings to those of the Redeemer, she begot the mystical body of Christ. Yeah. And then he goes on to cite even René Laurentin in support of this. Right, yeah. And Father Laurentin, who, 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 you know, God bless him, was, was not a real friend of uh, co-redemption in many ways, uh, did a great defense biblically uh, against Raymond Brown and some of the errors uh, that he put forward with the infancy narratives. And he also uh, commonly... Uh, juxtaposed Revelations 12 with John 19. That uh, and 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 as the Father said, Mary had two births. They were not both to be painful. The first birth of Bethlehem would be free from pain because pain is a result of original sin. Pain is a result of the fall. Our Lady was free from original sin and its effects. Blessed Pius the Ninth tell us. So. The second birth is going to be very painful because she's giving birth to us. That, that goes back to her, why she is declared spiritual mother of all humanity, because she just went in labor with Jesus to give us birth. And that's that's the labor pain of untold suffering, of, of unprecedented suffering. So, yes, she's crying out in labor because of the pain of us, but not of Jesus. Exactly, exactly. And I might add another dimension to... Uh, the pain of childbirth uh, at, 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 under, at Calvary, uh, there's the, another dimension that St. Pius X brings out. It is great 1904 encyclical Adium Illum, and he sees the pain of the woman of Revelation 12 as actually the pain of Mary now in heaven. And, and, and if I, I could, it's a rather remarkable passage. Please but if I may read it, and he, uh, and he says, 
um, first of all, talking about uh, the woman of Revelation 12, he, he says, everyone knows that this woman signified the Virgin Mary, the stainless one who brought forth our head. Well, I say everyone except certain biblical exegetes, <laughs> but, um, but um, everyone knows this. The apostle continues, and being with child, she cried, travailing in birth and was in pain to be delivered. John therefore saw the most holy mother of God already in eternal happiness, yet travailing in a mysterious childbirth. What birth was it? Surely it was the birth of us who, still in exile, are yet to be generated to the perfect charity of God and to the eternal happiness. And the birth pains show the love and desire with which the Virgin from heaven above watches over us and strives with unwearying prayer to bring about the fulfillment of the number of the elect. And, uh, and so, it, 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 in a way, she has the childbirth, the, the pains under the cross, but now even in heaven, in a mysterious way, she has birth pain, birth pains, try uh, as a mother with compassion for her children who still have not brought been brought forth to perfect charity. And that, uh, that that's so true, Robin. Look, I mean, we're seeing that we're seeing weeping statues. Now, one can disregard all weeping statues, uh, but you've got a ton of scientific documentation about what's happening with these weeping statues. But Think of you and I saw every abortion, every act of child abuse, every uh, element of human trafficking. Uh, to say that Our Lady is not suffering with her children is to say that Our Lady is not mother of her children in, in, a, in, a, in a full concept of that. And again, as we talked about in the previous program, some say, well, you can't have a beatific vision and you can't have suffering at the same time. Well, Jesus did at Calvary, didn't he? He had the yeah. beatific vision and he suffered. So it is, it is part of the mystery, and we don't use mystery lightly or as a theological cop-out, but it is part of this sublime truth that Our Lady continues to suffer mystically as her children suffer. And that's why uh, the, the Fatima call, which we'll deal with at the end of this master class in Mariology when we get to private revelation, the Fatima call to offer reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary is because... But from the words of Jesus, the child Jesus, and Our Lady herself, it's because of the offenses of ungrateful men piercing her heart at every moment. So yes. it's the reality of children suffering, humanity, almost 8 billion, and the rejection of children to her heart, which bespeaks this continued mystical suffering uh, of Our Lady. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, she reveals to Sister Lucia her heart you know, with, with swords in it, with, you know, with thorns in it. And uh, our, our Lord also asks of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque for reparation to his sacred heart. So some people might say, well, Jesus suffered once for all. That what's, that's what Hebrews 10.10 10 says. How could he be suffering now in, in heaven? But when our Lord appears to St. Paul, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me exactly. so uh, this is is some in in a mysterious way as as we've already alluded to with pope benedict the 16th he says that you know jesus will be in agony until the end of the world quoting pascal but in it, it, it has to do with his suffering in through us and for us in his mystical body the work of redemption is still being carried out and, and, and great mystics have seen this, that in suffering humanity, in some mystical way, but real way, Christ is united to that suffering. Yeah, and, and we'll see too, uh, even with the church approved apparitions at Akita, where, you, where Our Lady weeps 101 times, she speaks in that critical October 13th, 1973 message. And again, uh, these, this is private revelation, but it is uh, approved by the local bishop, Bishop John Ito, after he read this message to Cardinal Ratzinger, and Cardinal Ratzinger gave him the approval to continue. Uh, she says the cause of her suffering is, again, things like cardinal versus cardinal, bishop versus bishop, the loss of priesthood and religious life, and the potential loss of so many 
members of humanity through uh, what is predicted as a, a purification by fire, and even referring it to as a new deluge with fire falling from the sky. But all of this is to say Revelation 12 is continuing today. There's the great battle between the woman and the dragon for souls today. And that's why uh, scripture is so richly testifying. You know, Cardinal Newman once said, Mary is present on every page of the Bible. And some would see that as, a, you know, an exaggeration. But in, 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 the, in the true sense of the role of the woman ordained by God the Father to be with and under Jesus in this work of redemption, uh, there's a certain truth to that reality. But, but clearly, even the passages we've gone over in these, in these three episodes tell us of the, the huge testimony of Scripture to the truth about the woman of the redemption, the Immaculate Redemptrix. Yes, and I, I remember John Paul II in, in the Gospel of Life, his 1995 encyclical Evangelium Vitae, referring to the the dragon the devil wishing to devour the child and he links this to abortion yeah, that yeah. the devil is the enemy of life and in every child that is conceived we have uh, our lord somehow uniting himself uh, as as gaudium et spes uh, uh, i think it's 22 tells us he united by the incarnation he united himself in some manner with every human being. So uh, the devil can't create life, but he can attack life and try to destroy it. So uh, John Paul II brilliantly applies Revelation 12 to the horrible evil of abortion. The devil is seeking to devour the child um, that has now, that our Lord uh, 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 died for, and the devil wants to destroy that. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, Profound insight, and and thank you for conveying that from 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 Saint John Paul II. And it's of course a, a grave, grave evil we're facing today. We're presently around 40, uh, 43 to forty four million abortions each year, and that's why again the battle of Revelations uh, twelve continues. So, well, thank you, Robert. I have to say it's such a joy uh, doing these programs with a living Marian encyclopedia of references. Uh, and also with great insights of the heart. And I pray to our viewers that this is serving you uh, as a masterclass in Mariology. The truth about the mother is such that it cannot be kept secret. It must be proclaimed. And that's also why we pray for a proclamation of a fifth dogma, that Mary's spiritual motherhood as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate will be proclaimed because that too will allow Our Lady to crush the head of Satan in all the forms of which she's attacking uh, humanity, the, the rest of her offspring, as Revelations 12, 17 says. So again, thank you, Robert, for our program today. So grateful. Thank you very much. And we, we pray for a, a blessed Holy Week and, and Easter. For all yeah. blessings. And thanks for being with us at a Masterclass in Mariology. God bless you all.